Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Hello and Happy New Year. Welcome to episode 292 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. What was everyday life like for those who lived in early America? This is still the question you ask me most. And to get at the everyday lives of early Americans, we should really look at the goods that they made and how they produced those goods. In essence, nothing explains everyday life as much as the goods in people's lives. This is why in this episode, we're going to investigate craft and craftspeople in early America. Our guide for this investigation is Glenn Adamson, a scholar who has served as the curator or director of research at several museums, and a scholar who has spent much of his career researching crafts and craft goods. Using details from his book, Craft and American History, Glenn reveals how we should think about and understand the term craft, who could be an artisan or a tradesman in early America, and how movements like the Consumer Revolution and the Industrial Revolution impacted the everyday lives of early American craftspeople. But first, the Ben Franklin's World subscription program helps you help us. The Omohundro Institute and I need your help to produce this podcast. We receive a lot of feedback from listeners like yourself that tells us that you really value the high-quality historical research that we bring to your attention, the narrative episodes and series that we started producing last year, and the high quality of our editing and audio. All of these features are the result of a lot of labor and resources. In fact, it takes us an hour of labor to produce each minute you hear on this podcast, and sometimes it takes us more than that. So we could really use your help to sustain this. Please become a subscriber by joining our subscription program at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. In exchange for your monthly or annual support, you'll receive access to ad-free versions of each new episode and monthly bonus episodes that mostly feature answers to additional questions that you have about a given topic. To become a subscriber, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. All right, are you ready to explore the world of early American craft and the everyday lives of craftspeople? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Our guest has served as the director of the Museum of Arts and Design, as the head of research at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and as the curator at the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. He's also written and co-written several books, including Craft and American History. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Glenn Adamson. Hi, thank you, Liz. It's great to be with you today. Now, Glenn, you know in your book Craft that Craft is something that has long been associated with British North America and the early United States. So I wonder if we could begin our conversation with having you tell us what you think craft is and how you think we should be thinking about craft in the early American context. Sure, yeah. I think it's a hard word for some people to define. And the way I use the term is pretty common sense, I hope. I just mean making things skillfully more or less with your hands, you know, with hand tools rather than with machines, for example. So really, it's something that you could think about as existing in contrast to industry or to factory production. And that's really, really important, particularly in the context of early America, because of course, like Britain at the same time, that was the period in which the Industrial Revolution was happening. So that's when you have, for example, Eli Whitney and the cotton gin, and eventually you start to get interchangeable parts, manufacturers in all sorts of different branches of industry. And it's actually at that time, I would argue that craft is really defined as an idea and becomes a cultural force in its own right for the simple reason that until you had the Industrial Revolution, everything was made by hand. So you really didn't have a reason to single out craft as a special thing. So over the course of the 19th century, what you see is that craft starts to emerge as this special 
way of making things with its own associations, you know, associations to tradition, associations to particular types of people, people who work with their hands like women, like members of the working class, also like Native Americans. And so there's a lot of cultural baggage that gets attached to it. But fundamentally, what I mean when I say craft is just making things with your hands. Was craft a term that early Americans in both the British colonial context and in the early United States would have used to describe their work if they were indeed making something by hand? Hmm, super question. Not always. The term that I often use when talking about craftspeople of that time is artisan, which has that word art in it. You know, here art meaning not painting and sculpture, but art like the skill of doing something or the ability to do something. The word craft really starts to acquire a commonality and the kind of baggage that I was just talking about. A little bit later on, you might think about the arts and crafts movement, for example, which is the turn of the 20th century. So it's a little complicated because lots of words get used and in different ways at different times. But at the period of the Industrial Revolution and the American Revolution, I think what you'd most commonly see is people talking about trades. So artisans with their trades, and they might also talk about the secrets or mysteries of those trades. And so we're really thinking here about something that's professional and has to do with a certain class of people who are able to make stuff and, you know, keep the economy going. Since we're on the subject of terminology, we often read in history books the terms artisans and tradesmen. Did and do those terms actually mean the same thing? Are they synonymous for early American craftspeople? Or do these terms refer to a different type of practice when it comes to craft? They were pretty much equivalents. Tradesmen would also probably take in people who aren't necessarily makers by hand. So you might think of a tradesman as being perhaps a brewer or even somebody who's not making anything at all, people who are essentially not aristocrats or not merchants. So it also could designate a kind of tier in the class system, you might say. I guess the other thing to say here, of course, is that artisan, tradesmen, all those kind of professional terms generally were only applied to certain types of craftspeople on the basis of demographics. And just to put it bluntly, here we're talking about white men. Of course, that is far from a complete representation of the people who we should now consider to be early American craftspeople, notably including women. So, you know, half the population already. And then, as I mentioned before, also Native Americans, who, of course, were never recognized as tradesmen or hardly ever by settler colonial groups. And then the other super important category here would, of course, be African Americans. Of course, many, many early American artisans were, in fact, enslaved but they wouldn't have been accorded that kind of respect or recognized as having professional skills, even if they had skills far in advance of the white craftspeople with whom they were actually economically competing. I'm glad you brought up women, because Stessa wonders whether early American women could produce works of craft. And if they could produce craft, which types of craft do you typically see women producing and practicing in this period? Yeah, this is maybe a little bit of a surprising part of the story, actually. Because maybe most people, when they imagine what women were making by hand in their colonial period or the early national period, or let's say before the Civil War, what they would be imagining is what are called domestic accomplishments. So this would be especially various forms of needlework. And I think most people will have seen, for example, samplers that girls would have made, you know, the alphabet and numbers and maybe some motifs, ornamental decoration that would show that they were capable of self-discipline and would probably make good wives. So there's that kind of home craft that's so-called amateur, maybe another term we could get into. But what people might not realize is that a lot of women actually were very involved in trades and in craft professions, and a very wide range of them too. So that could be anything from silversmithing to shoemaking, even upholstery. And a great example of that would, of course, be Betsy Ross who I talk about a bit in the book. Most people think of Bessie Ross as the person who designed and made the original U.S. flag. Sadly, that proves not to be the case, or very, very unlikely anyway. That seems to be a legend that was put about 100 years later or so by her descendants. But what she did do was to run an upholstery shop after her husband, who was the original proprietor of the shop, had died. And she did that for decades under her own management. 
So that you could say is a much more impressive and interesting achievement than having made a flag. But actually, that's a very typical pattern. You would often find widows taking on surprisingly prominent trade identities after their husbands had passed away. So it sounds like women may have been centered in home crafts like sewing, which you typically do around the house. But you do have a lot of women like Betsy Ross, who was an upholsterer, which was a craft that required a lot of traditional women's work like sewing, but it was also a highly specialized craft that she actually apprenticed for. Yes, although again, not exclusively. So I mentioned shoemaking, which I suppose also involves quite a lot of stitching. But you might, I think if you hadn't thought about it much, you might think of the early American cobbler as very much a male figure. But actually, that was something done by whole families really as a cottage industry. And then you also will find women operating in other trades that are really seen as male at the time. For example, printing, Benjamin Franklin's own trade. There were actually quite a few women who were activated in the printing industry, again, often because they had taken over shops from their husbands. Now, to practice any sort of craft, you'd have to have some knowledge and skill. So how did early Americans acquire the skill and knowledge that they would have needed to practice a certain kind of craft? Right. So again, this is maybe a little bit of a surprise because I think most people, when they imagine learning skills in the 18th century, probably immediately think of the word guild, which is a professional trade organization that not only oversees apprenticeships and then progress to the journeyman and master status for the craftsperson, but also imposes other kinds of trade standards, which could be anything from quality control to pricing. And frankly, America basically just never had a functioning guild system in most trades for the simple reason that people were just too mobile. So, for example, apprentices would often flee their shops before their term was up. Again, Benjamin Franklin is a good example of that. He uh, sort of took a look at what was going on and thought he could do much better on his own, which turned out to be absolutely true. But that was hardly unusual. So not only apprentices, but also indentured servants, who, of course, were very common in the 18th century in North America. It was a system that was often in the state of breakdown, sort of perpetual breakdown. So the way that people did learn skills was much, much more informal. Often they would learn within families. Sometimes they would learn through a placement within a shop, even if it were abbreviated or interrupted. And then, of course, you just had a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning in, as I say, a more informal situation. And that could be anything from a small shop, like a furniture shop, to what then might have been called a factory, even if it was using principally hand production. And here I'm thinking about things like glass making or working in an iron forge, iron foundry, that kind of thing. Those skills were often just shared on the shop floor and you kind of learned as you went. You mentioned the guild system, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about this system and how it worked. Yeah, I mean, that again is something you would see more operating in a European context. The famous examples would be in really the kind of officially mandated, highly organized training system that we would associate with Europe during that period. Paris, for example, where you have a very, very finely distinguished system of different trades, a very strong sense of centralized control as to who could participate in those trades and who could actually represent themselves as an artisan in that field. And of course, you have that to a certain extent in London and in other European cities as well. Very powerful guild system in Germany. And actually, Germany is a really interesting example because you had a lot of people making what they would have called masterpieces, Meisterstück, that were these showcases for their skill when they became trade masters. So that, as I say, is more of a European phenomenon. It didn't really get embedded here in the United States. Having said that, of course, there are a lot of immigrants that are coming out of that guild-enforced system. And that's a whole other interesting topic because you often find that the most skilled people in the colonies or ultimately the United States are recent immigrants. But because of native prejudice and simply defensiveness, economic protectionism, those same immigrants were often regarded with great suspicion and hostility. So it's an interesting part of the story that some of the most skilled people are often really the targets of abuse and exclusion. I've already mentioned African-Americans and women and immigrants would be another example of that. So what you start to see is a picture where craftspeople 
are simultaneously the props that are keeping the economy going, but often, particularly when they are very skilled, are the subjects of various forms of oppression and, you know, dislike and political opposition. Okay. Say you learned a craft, either through a very formal apprenticeship system like those in Europe, or through a more informal method of learning, like you learned in the shop of a family member or from a friend or neighbor. What was your everyday life like as a craftsman practicing your craft in early America? So again, I think the image and the reality really diverge here. Probably if people have an image of the early American craftsperson, it's of somebody who is, you know, like whistling while they work and has a relatively, not an easy life, but a life that's marked by a certain organic integration between home and work and, you know, very close relationships with their clients, you know, sort of personal network that's holding them together. And again, that could be the case, but very often it wasn't. Clearly wasn't true of enslaved artisans at all. They were very mobile and certainly not at their own discretion. But even out in rural areas, there's a lot of economic disruption through the 18th and 19th century. A lot of craftspeople do go bankrupt or have to sell their tools. And even when things were going well, it was a hard, hard life. You know, people were working long hours, most daylight hours. And it was also in an interesting way, I suppose you could think of this as a kind of integration, but they were not full-time craftspeople, again, especially in rural areas. They would also be farmers and they would be taking in other kinds of piecework and getting their income from a variety of sources with, let's say, chair making or blacksmithing being only one of those. So the idea of Longfellow's blacksmith standing under the chestnut tree, proud individual just relying exclusively on that craft. That's really an ideal, but was hardly ever a reality. It's interesting because I think when we think about tradespeople, we think of men like Benjamin Franklin, right? And we have this image of the individual craftsman standing by his press. And at least for Franklin, he's able to make a very good living at printing. I mean, he retires at 42. That's right. Although, again, Franklin is much more the exception than the rule in all sorts of ways. I mean, it might be interesting to talk about him for a second because he became really the center of this so-called self-made man narrative or mythology. To some extent during his own lifetime, you know, he was very much honored by other artisans and really held up as a hero by other craftspeople, especially in Philadelphia. But really it's in the 19th century that he starts to become this object of intense, hey, geographic veneration. And at that point, there's a whole really, you have to call it a cult of the self-made man that was adopted by a very wide range of people, including, by the way, Frederick Douglass, the great black orator. And the idea there was that the classic American story was that of somebody who, you know, as they say, picked themselves up by their own bootstraps and made themselves a success through hard work and skill and strength of character. And, you know, that's really you have to say, a mythology that still has a grip on the American imagination today. And it's basically just never been true. I mean, as you can imagine, economic mobility was very rarely driven by a willingness to work hard because everybody was working hard, and particularly people who were in marginalized demographics. So there's really no correlation that you can draw between some vague sense of character or willingness to put in long hours and actual social advancement. And there's not nearly as much social mobility in early America as a lot of people would like to believe there was. So that self-made man myth is one that I take particular care to try to dismantle in the book. Can you tell us more about the self-made man myth and how it came into being, what its origins are? Yeah. So again, we're going ahead a little bit in time, really to the 1830s, 40s, the years before the Civil War. And I think one factor you might think about in relation to this is just the explosion of American publishing. So this is right in the heart of the 19th century, and there's a very strong moralizing character to public discourse at that time. And I guess one way to think about it is that publishing self-made man hagiographies, in other words, biographies of Franklin and others who were understood as being self-made, was a way to sell books to younger, especially male readers. And the great example here would, of course, be the Horatio Alger novels, which are kind of the template 
around which a lot of these things are propagated. So not only those novels, but other ones that sort of knock off the idea of, you know, the kid who faces all sorts of adversity and just wins through through the strength of his own willpower. So it's a real phenomenon of the mid-19th century, that whole discourse, and one that I think did a lot to shape the way that craftspeople thought about themselves, as well as the way they were thought about by others. Now, Lydia wonders about the cost of producing a craft. So we've heard that one cost was that you needed to do a lot of hard work and perhaps even physical labor to perform your craft. But Lydia wonders that given all of the physical labor that went into producing a craft, whether craftspeople would have chosen to produce mostly for home use or mostly for selling things on the market. So the distinction here would be, again, between a professional tradesperson and everybody else, because you have to remember that this is a period when there's much more what I call material intelligence out there in the general population. In other words, people know both how to do stuff and they also understand how things are made in a way that we just don't now. So, you know, this is obviously a time before smartphones and advanced black box technology. So people have a much better sense of how things just happen in their material environment. So everybody's crafting stuff all the time. That's maybe the first thing to say. But then you have this subsection of the population who are making things professionally, and they are really oriented to the market in ways that, again, might be quite surprising. For example, I was amazed to learn when researching the book that the stone carvers who were making tomb markers, you know, gravestones up in Boston and in Chelsea, which is a area outside Boston, they were actually selling their tombstones all the way down the east coast of the United States and even to the Caribbean. So there's tremendous mobility of commodities at this time. And, you know, again, that's a story you could tell about furniture, about textiles, about silver, about ceramics, everything is moving all over the place. And so the artisans truly are involved in these very broad, widely distributed markets. I might just say one other thing about the cost of performing a craft, which is that in addition to the cost of materials, and as you say, the time and labor that's put in, there's also the tools. And another really important distinction between a tradesperson or a professional artisan and a non-professional is simply the tools that they would have, which of course could be handed down through inheritance, so within a family. And in the absence of a guild system, often the way that you knew that somebody was an artisan was simply that they actually had the tools of the trade. You mentioned that trade networks by the 18th century were fairly widespread and that goods could really move to far and wide places around the globe when they use these trade networks. And Jeremy would like to know if you could talk to us about the 18th century consumer revolution, of which these trade networks were a part of, and how this revolution impacted craft and the role of artisans in British North America and the early United States. So I know this is a big question. Could we begin with the consumer revolution? Could you tell us what the consumer revolution was? That's a really great question and hard to answer easily. I mean, the short answer is capitalism. (laughs) So, you know, here we're probably thinking about the Netherlands in the 17th century in relation to other European markets. We're also certainly thinking about imperialism and colonialism. So this is a really a European story, principally, rather than a North American story, except insofar as North America itself is a colony and is really originally designed to extract raw materials and send them back to Britain to be processed. So that's the kind of early form of mercantilist economy that you might associate with the first hundred years of what we now think of as capitalism. So it's, it's a big, complicated global story. But the basic elements of it have to do with Europe starting to extend their political dominance over a larger and larger part of the world, more activity at a global scale in terms of markets, maritime shipping at a new level, and also, of course, the realities of the slave trade and the way that slavery could be used to extract raw materials and resources, whether it was silver in Argentina or cotton in North America. And the way that those staple goods drove the economy, again, centered politically in Europe. Great. And now to move into Jeremy's question, could you tell us about the 18th century consumer revolution, its trade networks, and how the consumer revolution really impacted craft and the role of artisans in British America and the early United States? 
Sure, that's an important question from Jeremy. And I have to say, this is a really complicated one. You know, there are professional historians who spend all their lives studying this period, the consumer revolution, and arguing about what it actually was and how it worked and when it started. I'll just say a couple of things. One is that, at least from my point of view, or you could say the point of view of the artisans themselves, the key thing about the consumer revolution is consumer choice. In other words, you have many, many more types of thing to choose from. So if you're going to buy, let's say, a dining set that's going to be for your home, it might not only be in lots of different materials, metals versus ceramics versus wood, which would always have been the case, but within each of those material classifications, you're going to have much, much more in terms of options. So you'll have hundreds of different ceramic patterns to choose from, both imported and locally made. And those would also say a lot about you to other people. So it's like a language that people are speaking in a new way. And of course, for artisans, what that meant was that they had to be able to master lots of different idioms stylistically. They also needed to change their stylistic language, their vocabulary. So, you know, now looking back, we can look at a mahogany chair from Philadelphia and say what year it was made with a pretty high degree of confidence within, you know, three, four or five years, because the style was changing so quickly. And that was very much a new thing. And then the last thing to say is that, of course, the consumer revolution and the industrial revolution happen not necessarily at the same time. Usually people think the consumer revolution is earlier and it's quite broadly distributed by the time that machine production, mass production starts really in earnest. But you have to say that the factory system vastly amplifies the effects of the consumer revolution simply because it drives down the price of goods so swiftly. So that idea of choice becomes available to a larger and larger group within the overall population. And that, of course, involves artisans as well as mass producers until the artisans are essentially put out of work entirely. But that takes a long time. You know, the factory system is really just emerging in the late 18th century. And in most trades, you still have craft production as the dominant practice until the late 19th century, at least. Now I'd like for us to talk about the people who produced craft. So we've talked about how in the context of British America and the new United States that a lot of professional tradesmen and craftsmen were white men. But in your book, Craft, you also mentioned that Native Americans practiced crafts. So would you tell us about Native Americans' practice of craft and Native American craftspeople? Yeah. And, you know, again, it's maybe worth emphasizing that although white men, working class white men, make up a substantial percentage of early American artisans, they were not the majority. As I said, you know, half of them are women, just for starters. And then when you factor in people from other ethnicities, you know, it's important to recognize that it's not that white men are the norm and everyone else is the exception. That's hardly the case. In terms of Native American craft skills, maybe the first thing to say is that they were way more skilled than anybody else in early America, particularly in the 17th century. And here we might go all the way back to the beginning of what you might call settlement or invasion, depending on your point of view. And, you know, just think about the fact that in Jamestown or in Plymouth, where the Mayflower landed, the Native American population really kept the white settlers alive through their superior agricultural and craft skills. And right through the 17th and 18th century, white people really looked at Native Americans with something resembling awe at their level of competency, self-sufficiency, autonomy, ability to stay alive in the wilderness, but also master so many different skills, leather work, shell work, woodwork, ceramics, you name it. Maybe the other thing I could say about that whole story is that Native Americans, at the same time that they were really upheld as exemplars of that form of knowledge were at the same time despised because they didn't seem to understand the value of that knowledge. In other words, from a European point of view, Native Americans were understood as not being able to value their time and value their work. So a good example of that would be wampum, which originally, of course, was made of shells, quahog shells, eventually became displaced by imported beads. But white commentators would say, well, this is the value of this wampum, but look at how long it takes to make it. So these Native Americans don't seem to understand literally the value of their own time. But what that shows you is that obviously 
the native population wasn't thinking of time in that way. They didn't have this kind of one-to-one relationship between time and money that, of course, was intrinsic to capitalism, but not intrinsic to the traditional economies of native peoples. Throughout all the research that you've done, Have you ever found an example or perhaps examples where native craftspeople met with European or American craftspeople and both sides exchanged ideas about what they thought of the other's craft and their ability to produce goods? I think the best evidence that we have about that really comes from objects themselves. So the way that native made objects register European influence is often just through the material incorporation of imported goods or motifs. And there are some fantastically interesting examples of that. The insertion of glass beads into the repertoire of native craft is a really striking example of that. So previously, beads would have been made of bone or shell, but already by the 18th century and then really flourishing through the 19th century and down to today, you have an amazing facility and creativity that is unleashed on these very colorful beads, which might have been coming in from Italy or the Czech Republic, we would now call it now, then Bohemia. And that added a kind of polychromy and also a delicacy of detail to Native American beadwork that was really not precedented in their own traditions pre-contact. So it's really in those objects that you see the conversation unfolding and to great aesthetic effect. You also mentioned earlier that enslaved people would practice crafts. Would you tell us about the different crafts that enslaved people practiced and whether they had any say about the crafts that they would learn and practice? The story of enslaved craftspeople is one of the most important that I tell in the book. I think it's, again, something that might not be on a lot of people's radars. Maybe the first thing to say is that it was pervasive in the sense that enslaved Black Americans built a lot of the country. Not only were they absolutely bedrock to the economy because of field workers, but the enslaved population also constructed architecture. They were blacksmiths, they were barbers, they were seamstresses, they were woodworkers, and so many other crafts that really there was no craft that was practiced in the 18th century in which black people were not active, with the possible exception of weapons manufacturing. I would imagine that that's probably an area where Black craftspeople were often discouraged from participating. But even that didn't stay true because, you know, in the years before the Civil War, you had enslaved Black people actually literally making armaments for the Southern Army. So there's really no area of American craft that's untouched by slavery. Then we could also think about what that looks like from the perspective of the enslaved person. Because, well, let me put it this way for a white person, having a skill simply meant probably you would have a higher income as a working class person. For a black person, it could often make the difference between life and death, because if you had a skill, you weren't actually going to be sent out into the cotton or the tobacco fields. And of course, if you were sent into the fields, you were quite likely to be worked to death. Whereas if you were a skilled craftsperson, then frankly, you were just too valuable to destroy in that way. And also, there's at least a little bit of mobility that enslaved craftspeople would have. You know, one of the haunting artifacts that you can look at from that period of time is these badges that were given to slaves that would identify them as they went around cities or towns on their business. And that had to do with the fact that they might actually be lent out or sold out, you know, essentially to another work site by their owners to complete some labor for someone else. So they had a certain amount of mobility that other enslaved people often did not famous example, again, mentioning Frederick Douglass, would be his escape from the docks of Baltimore. He had been an enslaved ship's caulker, a very difficult, onerous dockyard craft in the middle of the 19th century. And it was because he had that little bit of mobility on the docks that he was able to make his escape to freedom. It sounds like there were some pretty profound differences between being a free craftsperson in the 18th and 19th centuries and being an enslaved craftsman. Yeah. And of course, the other group that we should mention here is the free black craftspeople, of whom there were many in the South and in the North. And they, again, didn't have it easy. Obviously, they had their freedom legally, but they suffered a great deal from, as you might expect, racism and simple economic competition from white craftspeople who might not be more skilled, but they often had more advantages in the trade, again, as you might imagine. 
And that's another important story that obviously goes right past the Civil War and into the period of the Great Migration, when you have many craftspeople, among others, leaving the South and going to the North and finding work there, often becoming successful entrepreneurs. So that uh, experience of the free Black craftspeople is another one I talk about a lot in the book. Would you tell us more about their experience? Because it sounds like if you had all these experienced free Black craftspeople moving from the South to the North, that there were markets in the North where some trades might have just become glutted as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's probably true to some extent, although you have in that period of the Great Migration, you have such a period of economic expansion that there's a tremendous pull for that population to go up to Detroit and be in the auto industry or Pittsburgh and be in the iron industry, for example. So I think it's kind of rational decision on the part of many Blacks who were involved in the Great Migration to leave the more explicit racism of the South. And I mean, that's obviously the period that lynching is at its most intense peak. So they're really fleeing for their lives in some case, we have to remember. But it's also an, an economic decision that they're making. I might step back a little further in time, though, and just say one other thing about free Black craftspeople, which is a little disturbing, but also fascinating, which is that free Black artisans often owned slaves and indeed were sometimes responsible for selling enslaved family members away from one another. So they were fully participating in the slave system, despite the fact that they were themselves African-American. A famous example of this would be the furniture maker Thomas Day, who was a very, very successful entrepreneur as a cabinet maker. But he actually is known to have been sympathetic to, or at least not to have objected to slavery and, and probably owned slaves himself. That is a really curious fact that before the Civil War, you would have these free Black craftspeople participating in the enslaved economy by owning other Black people. Do you know why they would have employed enslaved labor rather than free labor? Well, the same reason anybody would, because of course, it was very economically advantageous. You know, that's the brutal reality of slavery is that it paid off. And that's why it was so difficult to dislodge. From a Southern point of view, a Southern white point of view, you have to remember that freeing slaves was a tantamount to just taking away a huge amount of property from people because they had invested in those slaves and invested no little amount to own them and also to keep them alive. So when slavery finally came to an end after the Emancipation Proclamation, that was actually an economic body blow to the existing economy of the South. You know, it wasn't just idle evil that was keeping the slave system in place. It was that it was very, very lucrative. And so if you were a free black entrepreneurial artisan in the South, it was actually probably going to be quite difficult to compete, especially as a larger producer, unless you did participate in that system, because you obviously would have been at a huge economic disadvantage. Now, one of the interesting points that Glenn makes in his book, Craft, is that craftsmen were often known for their rebellious streaks. Glenn notes that craftsmen were highly active in the American Revolution and in later slave revolts during the 19th century. Glenn, could you tell us about craftsmen and the rebellious streaks? Why do craftsmen always seem to be at the forefront of revolutions and of social and economic movements? Yeah, it's a fascinating thing, and it stays true right through the whole history of the book. You know, if people remember the pussy hat protest that followed Trump's inauguration back in 2016, that idea of the hand-knitted pink hat and marching through the streets, that's a recent example. But you could go all the way back to let's say the Tea Party in Boston that happened in the early years of the revolution, those people that were dressed up as Native Americans and you know went onto that ship and took the tea and threw it into the harbor, they were almost all artisans. And of course, Paul Revere would be another famous example of this, you know, a silversmith who was the one who went on his midnight ride. So why is this? Well, I, I thought about that a lot while writing the book. And ultimately, the conclusion that I came to was really twofold. One is that artisans tend to be trusted in their community, and Revere would be a good example of this. You know, he was kind of a leading citizen. And if you think about it for a second, of course, he wouldn't have been entrusted with silver and that kind of value in his shop unless he was trusted. But even if you're not working in a luxury trade like that, an artisan can't really do their work unless their customers and their you know, local community have a high opinion of them, hold them in regard, and do in fact trust them. So that also could be converted into a kind of political credibility 
you could say. And again, Franklin would be a really good example of that as well. I guess the other reason is that craftspeople often are working in teams or in tight networks, not only within a trade, but also trades in relation to one another. And that naturally builds a sense of solidarity that doesn't have the kind of effect that it did in Europe during the 19th century. You know, we never had the kind of working class revolutions that happened in 1848, for example, in Europe, which you could, you know, argue about why that is and the relative emphasis on individualism versus class consciousness in this country. But to the extent that we have had class consciousness in America, it's tended to be among artisans and thinking about artisans as a group that had their own political interests and their own economic interests. That adds a really interesting insight into what we know about, especially mobs during the American Revolution, right? Is that you do have these tight networks. So when we think about the composition of mobs, that's probably why we do see a lot of artisans participating in them, is that it's easy to get word out about what's happening across these networks. And there's this natural feeling of solidarity that there'll be people there to back you up. Yeah. And of course, printing was itself a craft. So the mechanism by which the word was getting out was already dependent on craftspeople. We've mentioned Franklin a lot already, but there are also other printers who were, you know, very much artisan tradespeople. And they, of course, were very central in political discourse at that time. We talked about the consumer revolution and how it took place in the 18th century, the mid 18th century. And now we think we should talk about the industrial revolution. Glenn, Would you tell us about this revolution in the American economic market and how this event impacted craft and how it was practiced in the United States during the early to mid-19th century? So here we get to the central irony of the story, really, which is that the Industrial Revolution is itself the work of craftspeople. And by that, I mean that the folks who are inventing machines and prototyping them, and also, in fact, keeping the machines going, even once they were in wide use in factories across the United States. All of those people, of course, were artisans because machine building was a very skilled craft. I mentioned Eli Whitney earlier, and you know the cotton gin that he developed. He didn't actually see very much money from it himself because he wasn't able to successfully patent it or control his patent. But the cotton boom that was, at least in part, the result of the use of the cotton gin, that was a sort of inadvertent effect of his craft-based invention. And you could look at any mechanized industry in America in the early 19th century and somewhere along the lines find a craftsperson who is behind it. And again, that remains true for a long, long time. For example, Henry Ford of the assembly line, you know, in Fordism in Detroit, he started out his career as basically a skilled machinist. So the knowledge that it takes to implement technological innovation in the context of mass production, essentially always requires that craft-based know-how. But of course, the irony is that then those factories not only made terrible jobs for people, you know, very repetitive, loud, smelly, dangerous, all the rest of it, often low-paid as well, although just well-paid enough to get people away from the farms and into the factories, just like we see in other parts of the world now. But as those systems began to grow and grow and grow over the course of the 19th century, and particularly when we do get to Fordism in the early 20th century, it just becomes impossible for handmade goods to compete on price. And so the craftspeople are gradually pushed out. And ultimately, this leads you to the craft revivals and the sort of oppositional phenomena like the uh, arts and crafts movement, where craft is taken up as this kind of anti-capitalist, anti-mass production technique. But obviously, that couldn't have happened unless craft was pushed into that more minority position. Yeah. And I was just thinking that I'm curious about what it must have been like to practice a craft during the Industrial Revolution, a craft, say, like shoemaking, in an age when factories had really figured out how to mass produce shoes. Yeah. And that's such a good example, shoemaking. And in fact, where I grew up north of Boston, near Lynn, was a really good example of that where you do have the first factories growing up. They were so successful that Alexander Hamilton actually pointed to them as a beautiful, you know, instance of what he was hoping would happen in the economy more generally. You know, he was very interested in forward-looking mass production and using government tools as a way of funding those efforts. And he pointed to shoemaking as the sort of model. But if you were a shoemaker, boy, it was not a happy story because you went from being 
probably a family concern, so-called cottage industry, you know, making the shoes in what was called a 10-footer, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot building, to either working in an assembly factory, or more likely you were working at home still, but you were doing incredibly repetitive piecework. So just doing the same thing over and over and over again, like stitching an upper together. And that again could be a, a whole family, you know, father, mother, children working on that. But the centralization of resources in the hands of the factory owners, you know, who literally owned the means of production, that meant that they were able to push these peace workers into near poverty, just basically keep them barely alive with the amount that they were willing to pay. And that model then replicated itself, especially in other sewing based crafts, you know, dressmaking any form of leather work, all those kinds of hand skills in a way that was extremely deleterious to the lives of the working class in this country. It sounds like the Industrial Revolution brought a real drastic transformation in the everyday lives of skilled artisans. Oh, for sure. I mean, it was more gradual than we tend to think, but it was also striking enough that people commented on it all the time. And hardly ever in a positive way unless they were actually factory owners themselves or involved in the government like Alexander Hamilton. Do you recall any of the comments that artisans would have made about this change? Yeah, I mean, the comments often are actually not from artisans themselves initially, but actually people who are going to tour these factories and talking about how amazing they are, you know, in their scale and also loud and kind of alien. I almost think of them as like spaceships that have landed from the future and are sort of sitting there in the countryside. When you start to get craftspeople themselves talking about it, well, it's not so much craftspeople, really. It's more the workers. You know, a great example would be the largely female workforce that existed out in Lowell in Massachusetts. And they actually had kind of, you know, plant newspaper that was produced ostensibly to kind of keep up morale and as a piece of industry propaganda. But you occasionally get these insights into the way that women were thinking about their lives, you know, really feeling pretty sorry for themselves and telling stories about how the foreman would falsify the time on the clock to keep them working for an extra half hour, you know, well into the night. And then eventually, of course, you do get the strikes that happen in the 1830s there in Lowell. And you have protest songs and you have more explicit political, you know, language coming out of those workforces. And then that keeps going right well to the present day that you have workers contesting the terms on which they're being made to labor. And often what they're saying is we want to be more like craftspeople and less like assembly line workers. They don't, of course, want to have that kind of repetition, that kind of dehumanizing sameness. They want to actually have the right to make an object from start to finish according to their own terms. But of course, that becomes less and less common. Glenn, your book, Craft, offers an American history. And I wonder if you would tell us what viewing American history through the history of craft adds to our knowledge and understanding about the history of British North America and the early United States. So what do we gain by viewing American history through the history of craft? Well, I think the main thing I would say is that it's a type of history from below, which is a term people might have heard before. So the idea here is that instead of understanding the period of the American Revolution as shaped by people like Benjamin Franklin or George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, instead you think about it in a much more multiple way from the perspective of lots of people who may not have even written down their thoughts. So if you think about the objects that we still have from that period, or you think about the way that forces of economic and technological change affected people, it just gives you a much more nuanced and rich picture of what it was like to be alive then. But I think I would also say something a little more than that in the case of craft, because I think it really does make sense to think of craftspeople in American history as being protagonists. I don't want to say heroes, because I don't think you ever want to idealize any group of people. But as we talked about, they often were you know, the radicals, they were the revolutionaries, whether we're actually talking about the American Revolution or whether we're talking about later labor protest movements. And then again, we could take the story all the way up to the present day. Think about what happened in the 1960s in the counterculture, for example, that was often very craft-based, those sorts of protest movements. So I think it's hard to understand how 
progress has happened in America, both technologically and culturally, without understanding craftspeople as being right at the leading edge of those waves of change. Now it's time for the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, what might have happened if the Industrial Revolution had never happened? How would the history of craft and craftsmen have been different? So if the Industrial Revolution had never happened, that's a pretty big time warp because, of course, everything that we experience today is conditioned by that reality. So it's quite hard to unthink it. I guess what's interesting, though, is that that's exactly what people are trying to do. So this sounds like a kind of outrageous thought experiment. But right now, what people are saying is that if we want to preserve the environment, which, of course, was not on the radar for people in the 18th century because they had no notion of climate change as we do today, what a lot of people are advocating is essentially precisely this, a return to a craft-based economy that's local, that's small scale, that probably involves having fewer objects that are more expensive circulating in the economy rather than the deluge of mass-produced and mass-distributed objects that we do have. So, you know, if the Industrial Revolution had never happened, of course, maybe the most important thing is that climate change wouldn't have happened, at least not nearly to the same degree. And you also wouldn't have had anything like the kind of misery that's been experienced by countless generations of workers. Of course, on the other hand, you wouldn't have had all the benefits that the Industrial Revolution brought to us from cheap housing to medicine to other scientific advances. As I say, it's pretty hard to imagine what a non-industrialized world would be like in the 21st century. But looking back at the 18th and 17th century, you know, just before the Industrial Revolution, I think a lot of people would feel that that's kind of an ideal to strive towards and something that we can learn from. So, Glenn, are you researching a new project? Are you researching and writing anything new about craft? Actually, not about craft, but I'm working on a new project, which is about the concept of the future. So I'm writing a sort of long term, hoping to write a book called The Future, A History. It's about the way that people in all sorts of times and places have tried to get a handle on what was coming towards them, you know, what tomorrow would be like. And so that's anything from divination practices in the ancient world to the latest trend forecasters and risk assessment professionals. So different techniques that people have used to understand the future and what it might actually hold. Where's the best place to contact you if we have more questions about craft and craftspeople in early America? So I do have a website, which is just glenadamson.com. Then, of course, there's the other books that I've published, some of which are more academic. One of them is called The Craft Reader, which is an anthology of what other people think about craft and have thought. So if people just, you know, look me up online, they'll find lots of stuff like that. Glenn Adamson, thank you for providing us with such a great overview of craft and craftspeople in early America. It's been a pleasure to talk, Liz. Thanks so much. Viewing the history of early America through the lens of craft helps us gain a better understanding of the everyday people and the everyday lives they lived during this early period. It can also help us better understand and appreciate large early American movements like the American Revolution, the Consumer Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution, and how these movements impacted the lives of everyday people. People who weren't elite or famous or exceptional. People who, just like most of us, won't be singled out by historians of the future, but who still make important contributions to our families, communities, and American society. As Glenn related, most people in early America practice craft, or the tradition of making something by hand, such as when they made clothes, a new butter churn, or sewed together shoe uppers and lowers to help keep their families afloat during the winter months when their farms lay fallow. Many early Americans also practiced craft professionally, with the idea that they would produce goods to sell in the market. These craftsmen were often called artisans or tradesmen. These were people that early Americans often identified by their skill and by whether they had all the proper tools of their trade. Now, although many history books tell us that artisans and tradesmen were groups composed of white men, as Glenn revealed, half the artisans and tradesmen in early America were women. (laughs) 
and large proportions of artisans and tradesmen were Native Americans, free people of color, or enslaved. And all of these people produced goods professionally, like Mary Catherine Goddard of Baltimore, who printed newspapers such as the Providence Gazette and the Maryland Journal, or like cabinet maker Thomas Day, a free black man who made enough money by his craft to employ several enslaved workers to work in his shop in Milton, North Carolina. Craftspeople in early America, just as in more modern times, were the people who kept the American economy going. They were the first to be impacted by changes in the economy, and among the first to be impacted by changes in American society, which is partly why they've always had a rebellious streak. Whether we look at the protests of the American Revolution, the invention of the Industrial Revolution, or even the social and political strife of more modern times, we can often see tradespeople at the forefront of the work to move for change. As Glenn noted, it's hard to understand how cultural and technological progress has happened in the United States if we don't also understand that craftspeople have always been at the forefront of these movements and waves of change. Look for more information about Glenn, his book, Craft, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, all on the show notes page. benfranklinsworld.com slash 292. Please help support our work to bring great historical scholarship right to your ears. Become a Ben Franklin's World subscriber at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what other aspects of everyday life interest you? Please let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.